Well, hello and welcome to the second episode of Rock 3 Analysis. And today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the history and the background behind this piece because it's pretty fascinating. This will be the last video that I do before going straight into the analysis of theme one. So stay tuned for that next time. But first, let's explore what makes this piece so amazing historically. What were the situations that Rachmaninoff was in when he wrote this piece? And how does it differ from other pieces of his and other pieces in the time period? So Rachmaninoff lived from 1873 to 1943. The third concerto was Opus 30, and it was composed in 1909. Now, as a comparison, the second piano concerto, which is by far the more commonly performed and well-known of the concerti, was composed from 1900 to 1901, so roughly about a decade later. Now, Rachmaninoff is often labeled as a neo-romantic composer, meaning that he composed more or less in the romantic style of people like Chopin, and Brahms and from that classical tradition forward and he still held on to tonality although he did you know push the boundaries of that introduce other harmonies but unlike his contemporaries say Prokofiev or Stravinsky or Shostakovich he didn't really push the boundaries of tonality itself go into atonal and that uh, and he never composed any 12 tone pieces so when the average person hears that a piece is 45 minutes in length and is not really well versed in classical repertoire, they might think it's just an incredibly long piece of music. And it is, it's not one of the longest. Busoni wrote a piano concerto that's over an hour in length. And of course, operas are multiple hours many of the time. But it's important to remember that in that historical context and that framework, this was before the advent of recorded music and radio. Rachmaninoff did live to see those and he did produce recordings on LPs. But in this time frame of 1909, the process of recording was still in its infantile state. It wasn't until the 20s and the 30s that record technology had progressed far enough to really be something listenable and in the public mind and in the public ear. So in this historical time, both in Europe and in America, it was much more popular to go to concerts, to go to recitals, because that was a form of entertainment. You couldn't hear music at any other point. Just imagine if you couldn't flip through your phone and turn on Spotify or turn on the radio when you were driving. Uh, the only way that you can hear music is by going to see it live or by making it yourself. And speaking of which, it was very popular for people to play piano on an amateur level. So most households would have a piano in them and a much higher percentage of people would have at least a rudimentary basic understanding of how to play piano. Now on this theme of recording technology, perhaps some of you have listened to Rachmaninoff's recordings of the concerti or other recordings that he did. And usually the first thing that people notice is that he played very, very fast. Uh, and didn't take as much time as one would expect, as we're used to hearing in more modern recordings. However, one of the reasons is that, again, on those LP discs, there was a limited time frame that you had to record. So not only does he play fast, but there are certain measures that are omitted to fit everything onto that record. Now, some will argue that he really intended to play it this way, that it was more common to play at this speed with less, I guess, romantic flourishes than the modern concert pianist. It's really impossible to say though, because um, all of this is anecdotal from writings and things. So we can, only, we can only guess. All we know is he did not have access to uh, recorded technology that we have today, or even someone like Vladimir Horowitz, who popularized the third concerto, had access to. So he composed this piece before going to the U.S. This was going to be his first major concert tour in the United States. Um, and the piece was actually dedicated to the pianist Joseph Hoffman, who was very highly esteemed in his day by fellow pianists. Hoffman was regarded as having an excellent technique. Supposedly he could play anything with ease that would other pianists would struggle to get through. Uh, it is curious, though, Hoffman never played this piece and he never recorded it. Apparently, he declared that the piece was just not not right for him. Who knows what that means? All we know is uh, we don't, unfortunately, have the recording of Hoffman playing this concerto. The pianist who did popularize it, as I alluded to earlier, was Vladimir Horowitz. 
who Rachmaninoff highly regarded and even went so far as to say that Horowitz played the piece better than he did. Incidentally, it was Horowitz's RCA recording with Fritz Reiner conducting that was the first uh, the first recording that I was exposed to of this piece, and in my mind, it is still one of the best. Although he does not play the Austria cadenza, I wish he did. Just a personal thing of the two cadenzas that Rachmaninoff wrote. He chose the shorter, more quick-fingered passage work one, rather than the one with the huge chords. Now, as I mentioned, Rachmaninoff composed this for his tour in the United States. So his trip to the, from Europe to the U.S., of course, being in that time period, was on a ship. And he practiced the concerto on a silent piano, which would have been um, to not bother the other passengers. It was just a piano. Sometimes they would stuff something in so that the hammers wouldn't hit, or they had various ways of doing this. But... In other words, he had to practice without actually hearing the sound. Now, the first performance took place on November 28, 1909 in New York with Walter Damrosch conducting the New York Symphony Orchestra with the composer as the soloist. However, in his memoirs, Rachmaninoff had fond memories of playing the piece with the well-known composer and conductor Gustav Mahler. Now, this recording with Gustav Mahler took place on January 10th, 1910 with the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. I'm reading here from Sergei Rachmaninoff, A Lifetime in Music, and this is by the authors uh, Sergei Bertensen and J. Leda. On page 164, Rachmaninoff wrote, At that time, Mahler was the only conductor whom I considered worthy to be classified with Nikish. He devoted himself to the concerto until the accompaniment, which is rather complicated, had been practiced to the point of perfection, although he had already gone through another long rehearsal. According to Mahler, every detail of the score was important, an attitude too rare among conductors. I can only imagine what that concert must have sounded like. I wish I could have been there. Unfortunately, as we talked about, there is no recorded legacy of that concert. Now, as far as critical reception, in the United States of the Third Concerto, it was not the best. Uh, this is a theme that we find throughout classical music of a lot of the great masterpieces. Initially, when they are introduced, much of the time, the critics dislike it or even hate it. Uh, and it's not till later that they are recognized as great masterpieces. In the case of Rachmaninoff's Third Concerto, perhaps one of the reason is because Rachmaninoff was writing in that neo-romantic style, a little bit reminiscent of old times, and maybe some of the critics didn't think that he was forward-thinking or innovative enough. But whatever the case may be, it did not receive the best reviews. Now I'm going to read one of the reviews. This book is Rachmaninoff by Viktor I. Serov, and it says on page 127, a critic of The Sun wrote his review with such insight and fairness that after 40 years of the concerto's career, there is not much that one can add, despite the development and changes of our musical tastes. Here are some excerpts. The concerto was too long, and it lacked rhythmic and harmonic contrast between the first movement and the rest of the concerto. The opening theme in D minor is tinged with melancholy of a sort typical in late years of good deal of Russian music. This is the melancholy of inactivity, of what may be the resignation or submission or distrust of one's powers, and it does not rise, as did Tchaikovsky's, to the pitch of surging passion or high tragedy. I could not disagree more. And it's interesting that uh, this biography, which was written in 1950, more or less agrees with the conclusions of this critic. It says on the previous page, the critics unanimously agreed that the third concerto was not as striking in its originality as Rachmaninoff's second, that in parts it was vague and groped for form and theme, and that it was so loosely put together that one was more interested in the statement than in its development, which was both moody and indefinite. Again, I could not disagree more. However, that is just the way of things sometimes. It takes time for 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 things to become popularized. But even the second concerto did not receive a great welcome in the United States upon his arrival. And going back to the Sergei Rachmaninoff, A Lifetime in Music book, on page 162, it says, the second concerto seems to have made a bad start in America. All critics dismissed it following the lead of Philip Hale, 
who wrote in his program note for the Boston Symphony's first performance of the work, the concerto is of uneven worth. The first movement is labored and has little marked character. It might have been written by any German, technically well-trained, who was acquainted with the music of Tchaikovsky. So adding uh, racial insult to injury here with the assessment of Rachmaninoff's second concerto, which, of course, is one of the most beloved works of music of the classical repertoire to this day. Now, history aside, when it comes to the present day, why is it that the second concerto is still so much more played than the third concerto? I think first and foremost probably is just the technical difficulty of the piece. Having played both concerti, I can say that this, the third took a great deal more practice. And, um, and I don't know a single pianist who would argue otherwise. If you think differently, you can let me know in the comments. But even beyond the difficulty, I think perhaps the second concerto is a little bit easier to understand in its form. It's a little bit more user-friendly. Um, it has some beautiful melodies. And I think maybe the melodies are a little bit more memorable and singable than those that you find in the third concerto. For instance, here I'm looking, uh, this is a page of the popular culture references from the second concerto off of Wikipedia. And you can see uh, it's a lot of pop culture references. One of the most notable being Eric Carmen's All By Myself song. Uh, it's used in many movies. It's used in many animes. It's used in Korean movies. It's used, uh, gosh, a ton of different places. Themes are borrowed in a, by a ton of different musical artists. In contrast, the third piano concerto, if you look at the Wikipedia page in popular culture, <laughs> There's literally only one thing. This concerto is the main focus of the 1996 film Shine, based on the life of pianist David Helfgott. Of course, that movie went on to win several Academy Awards, Best Picture, Best Director, Best Original Screenplay, Best Actor, Best Supporting Actor, Best Original Dramatic Score, and Best Film Editing. Quite a lot of Academy Awards, so that did a great deal to push, push the third concerto into the public consciousness. However, the way in which it popularizes the concerto is by making this piece, uh, this monumental undertaking that seems unreachable and unattainable because of its difficulty. Um, there's that view that, oh, you're never ready to play this piece. And that is a view that is not only from the movie, it is a view that is commonly held about this concerto and a few other classical um, pieces. One of the ones that reached this level of like a classical pantheon. So there's this strange phenomenon that happens in classical music um, that creates this kind of stigma and idolization of certain pieces and composers. Uh, it's almost like they are no longer human and that you have to attain this superhuman level in order to play this piece. So Yevgen was telling me that where he comes from in uh, the former Soviet Union, anyone who tries to undertake this work will be laughed at, will be mocked. Um, it's a little bit different, I'd say, in America, uh, where, and especially now, more and more people are beginning to approach this piece. But even so, you if you tell someone you're working on The Rock 3, they'll be like, really? <laughs> like, are you sure you want to do that? And I think that viewpoint is a little bit unfortunate, this viewpoint of, oh, you need to reach this high culture level before you can play certain pieces or understand certain pieces. And one of the purposes of this project is to really bridge that gap between the piece and between the audience um, and to facilitate understanding and awareness of this piece and other structural masterpieces like it and not to just lazily assume that the lay people cannot understand it and so it's not worth trying. Now, speaking of bridging gaps, one of the most famous stories surrounding this piece is that of the pianist Van Cliburn, who was born in Louisiana and lived uh, the rest of his life in Texas, winning in 1958 the Tchaikovsky competition in Moscow. This was at the height of the Cold War, so cultural tensions were extremely high. And for an American to win a competition of Russian music was unprecedented. 
However, the nearly unanimous opinion is that this was very well deserved. In my mind, it was. If you listen to his uh, recordings, fantastic, phenomenal playing. And of course, the Rock 3 was one of the concerti that he played. This was such a cultural phenomenon that he made it to the cover of Time magazine, which called him the Texan who conquered Russia, later saying that the long-legged pianist had overnight become the object of the most explosive single outpouring of popular acclaim ever accorded to a U.S. musician. It's hard to imagine a classical pianist being on the cover of Time magazine today, but these were very different times. He became instantly famous after this, and his career included many historical achievements, like the first Grammy for classical music, the first classical album to go triple platinum, record-breaking concert ticket sales at venues such as New York's Carnegie Hall, Madison Square Garden, Chicago Grant Park, and Los Angeles Hollywood Bowl. Even though this concerto has a prominent place in the piano repertoire, there is still not that much written about it. There's still not that much accessible to the public. Yevgen was saying that one of his theory professors in Moscow was having a difficult time finding these theoretical writings and analysis that had been done. Uh, they weren't even uploaded, so she had to go through like the archives of this library and get special access. Uh, not the case with something like the second concerto, which has a lot more written on it. And lastly, I just wanted to tell one personal story about an experience I had listening to The Rock 3 performed live. I won't mention the name of this pianist, but it was a winner of a very notable competition. And I heard this performance several years ago. It was one of the most disappointing concerts I've ever attended in my life. Disappointing because I just expected more out of an international competition winner. And it was just played so passively without without any attention to the layers all i could hear was the top voice it was played too fast in parts too slow in parts i couldn't hear very well over the orchestra and just the general affect was extremely dull and boring i looked around i saw people falling asleep behind me and near me i even saw a few people get up and leave however at the end he received a standing ovation and i looked at the people around me who were standing and it was just this thing because in the state of Texas, you're just expected to stand up um, and applaud and give a standing ovation. Not the case when I was living in New York, it's just a cultural thing, but those moments as a musician stick with me and they make me want to give this piece a better name. Uh, there was this kid there who I looked at, he looked like he was probably in high school, looked like he was just bored out of his skull. And I felt so bad because this is supposed to be such an exciting piece. It was played horribly. And I literally didn't even stand up and applaud. I was so like physically angry <laughs> because it's this piece that I care so much for that I put so much work into and to see it played like that um, by, by someone who has the ability to do much better is disappointing. So by bringing this knowledge and putting it in a public forum, I want people to understand also not just about the piece, but what makes a good performance. You know, are you able to hear these, these layers? Are you able to hear, okay, this theme is different than this theme? From the exposition to development to the recapitulation, how do these things tie together? And when a musician does this, the audience processes it on a subconscious level for most of them if they're not trained. But by understanding some of these things, you can raise it from the subconscious to your conscious level, and then you begin to understand, oh, this is why I really like this performance. This is why I really like this piece. This is why I felt really bored. I didn't hear any of this. I didn't experience any of these things. And so you're a little bit able to better judge for yourself, and you don't have to feel this pressure of, oh, just because I went to this classical music concert, I have to feel like it was the greatest thing. And you're just a little bit generally better informed about the music that you're listening to. Lastly, I just want to say that I've heard this concern from people, and it was a concern that I had before, about learning more about the music. I've heard students say, say things like, well, if I learn too much, then the music will lose its magic. It will not seem as amazing to me. 
And I remember kind of having this fear when I was going from high school into college. And when I knew that I was going to major in music, I, I did have that thought like, am I going to get bored with this? Is this, going to, is this going to mess with the way that I experience music? And I can honestly say no, it's quite the opposite. The more that I learn, the more that I dig into this, the more that I understand, the more I realize that I have a lot to learn. And it's like exploring this, uh, this amazing landscape where the deeper you go into it, the more it opens up. That's one of the reasons I'll forever love classical music. It's one of the reasons I love this piece in particular, among others. And I hope that that comes across in this series. Next, we're going to cover the theme one. So we're going to be jumping straight into the music theory portion um, with analysis, with demonstrations. I hope to see you guys there. If you like this video, as always, please like, comment, and subscribe. I love hearing from you guys. I try to respond as much as I can. So thanks, and I will see you next time.